here's how that could be. Let's say you have 12 jurors in sentencing death, and let's say four of those jurors are black and all four say no to the death penalty. And the person that's being recommended for death penalty is somebody that's black. And the rest of the jurors are white or non-white. So now, because it's not unanimous, because of that, those black voices were silenced. What if that person is actually innocent, but the evidence hasn't came out yet, or the evidence hasn't been seen yet? This judicial system is far from perfect. And there is no, but, no, 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 no. Because the judicial system is also based on a system of white supremacy. So therefore, to make it easier to hand out death sentences would reflect very negatively upon who? So goes Florida, goes other states. When certain laws, especially laws that really are pretty draconian, those laws particularly get picked up by other southern states, whether it be Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. There's a death penalty law that came into place or really was updated over the last few months. And I think this is really important because as somebody that is an opponent of the death penalty, I think this really should give us pause, especially to people who are definitely unjustly put on death row. Let's get into it. Let's, let me share my screen and we're going to go into this, this law that Ron DeSantis signed into law here at 10 months after a jury remember last summer could not reach a, reach a unanimous verdict in the parkland shooters death penalty case the governor today signs a law that would change the death penalty in florida juries now only need eight out of the 12 members to recommend death fox 13's kylie jones here with us in studio tonight kylie this is uh, some big news here i know you spoke with a mother who lost her child in the parkland shooting and she told you this new law is going to save other parents from the pain she's feeling huh now first of all one thing i want to say is that it was, had to be a unanimous 12 jury decision to recommend the death penalty in this state. Now that has shifted from, you have, it does not have to be unanimous anymore. Now it only has to be eight out of 12. Which means it is literally making the death penalty easier to administer. It is easier to recommend the death penalty in Florida now. <laughs> Told you, it'll give you pause. Let's continue. Yeah, Mark, that sentence dug deeper into a wound she and the families of 16 other victims shared. This new law now makes Florida an outlier, but it has some questioning. Should we be making the ultimate punishment easier to hand down? When somebody killing 17 people, what else do we have the death penalty for if it's not for the killing of 17 people. The decision of life or death in Florida can now rest in the hands of only eight people. So now at the state of Florida, we have the lowest threshold to give somebody the ultimate sentence, that's the death penalty. Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law a bill that no longer requires a unanimous jury to sentence someone to death. The new law now only requires eight jurors to vote in favor of a death sentence. It opens the door to cases where there's some doubt certainly doubt about uh, the sentence and maybe even doubt about the guilt. Now, under the new law, a judge does have the ultimate discretion. The judge who's hearing the facts of this case can look at a jury and say, hey, it's a close call. It's eight to four. Based on the facts that this court considers, ultimately, 
the sentencing is up to the judge. The death penalty bill was filed on the heels of Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz narrowly escaping a death sentence. It's traumatizing to hear that the shooter is going to get life in prison when I have to go and visit my daughter at the cemetery. Lori Alhadef lives through excruciating pain every day. Her daughter Alyssa was one of 17 victims killed in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. We never imagined or expected somebody killing 17 people and shooting 17 people that they would not have gotten the death penalty. Critics say the law raises the risk of ending the life of someone wrongfully convicted. A person's life is at stake that's at least as important as whether they're guilty or innocent. Anthony Rickman, a Tampa area attorney, says this will likely change the legal strategy in these cases. We're going to have the prosecution being presenting as much evidence as they possibly can, shade, putting this defendant in as bad light as they possibly can, showing those aggravating circumstances the way they always have. It makes it now harder for the defense. And now it's important to note this law doesn't change the requirements for actually finding someone guilty. This law only applies in the sentencing phase of a death penalty case. Mark. Interesting indeed. So I know this is going to be an emotional topic because there are some people who feel that those who have done heinous acts should be put to death. My opinion is that as long as there are flaws in our system when judging people who actually have done heinous acts, the ending of one life is a life too many and to have a system where we potentially could be ending the life of somebody innocent, that's too great of a risk. Now, I personally am against the death penalty for that reason. Because let's say there's 10 people who are absolutely, let's say there's nine people absolutely guilty of what they did and are deserving of death. But then you have that one person, that's the 10th, that is innocent. Should we still keep the death penalty for a person that is that one that is innocent for the sake of the nine? I'm of the opinion that I'd rather the nine die in prison than ending the life of the one. You may disagree with me. Okay, that's fine. But to make it so that it is no longer a unanimous decision and it's making it easier That means that increases the risk of somebody who is innocent receiving the death penalty. Let's get into the details because uh, there's, you know, I want to get into the details of this story. I think it's important. Um, so here we go here. It says Florida death penalty game of chance targeted says a 2023 law that lowered the number of jurors needed to recommend execution has resulted in a quintessential game of chance for inmates being released because of the changes in the state's death penalty process and unconstitutionality silences black voices. Groups are arguing in what could be a pivotal Florida Supreme Court case. I want you all to remember this, that even though we black people are only 13% of the population. We are almost 50% of the people in prison. Meaning that we are going to be disproportionately targeted in laws like this. Let's continue. 
says the law allowed death sentences to be imposed based on recommendations of eight to tw of 12 jurors, an easier threshold than a previous requirement of unanimous jury recommendations. The change prompted by Parkland shooter, Parkland school shooter, Nicholas Cruz, receiving a life sentence after a jury did not unanimously recommend death, gave Florida the lowest death penalty jury standard in the nation. Says allowing eight to four recommendations was the latest in a series of changes in the capital sentencing process after a 2016 U.S. Supreme Court decision in a case known as Hearst versus Florida found the state's process unconstitutional. That ruling led to Florida Supreme Court to decide unanimous recommendations were required for death sentences, which the legislator later enshrined in state law. Justices ordered resentencing for about 150 death row inmates who have been sentenced based on non-unanimous jury recommendations. Amid the sentencings, I'm sorry, amid the resentencings, a revamped Florida Supreme Court backed away from the unanimous requirement and paved the way for the 8-4 to four law, which took effect on April 20th, 2023. Michael James Jackson, who was convicted of two, of two 2005 Jacksonville murders, is among about 40 death row inmates whose resentencings were pending when the 8-4 to four law went into effect. A jury voted 8-4 to four on May 25th, 2023 to recommend execution for Jackson, and a judge issued a death sentence in August. In a friend of the court brief filed last week in the Jackson case, a coalition of groups argued that the death penalty standards have injected an unconstitutional haphazardness in the resentencing process in cases that were pending when the law changed. These groups, including Florida Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the Florida Public Defenders Association, the Florida Justice Institute, Floridians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty, and conservatives concerned about the death penalty, argued that the 8-4 requirement has been applied based on chance. So it says the resentencing standards hinge on an arbitrary drawing line based on the date. The sentencing was finalized. Melanie Cl uh, Kalmanson, an attorney with the Quarles and Bradley LLP firm, who frequently writes about the death penalty, wrote on behalf of the two groups. She says, data on the Hearst resentencing proceedings show that whether a capital defendant was resentenced under Florida's post-Hearst unanimity, un unanimity statute or the 8-4 statute is the quintessential game of chance. Jackson's case, the first direct Florida Supreme Court death penalty appeal under the 2023 law, also drew a brief Tuesday from groups and black state lawmakers alleging the 8-4 law unconstitutionally violates equal protection rights of jurors and silences black voices. Groups signing into Tuesday's brief include the NAACP, Florida State Conference, and Equal Ground Educational Fund, along with five black state representatives and a former state senator who are Democrats. So it says 2023 law disproportionately excludes black jurors votes in capital sentencing. That's from Christopher Ballew, an attorney with the Gibson Dunn Crutcher firm wrote in the 29 page brief. So here's how that could be. Let's say you have 12 jurors in sentencing death and let's say Four of those jurors are black and all four say no to the death penalty. And the person that's being recommended for death penalty is somebody that's black. And the rest of the jurors are white or non-white. So now, because it's not unanimous, because of that, those black voices were silent. What if that person is actually innocent, but the evidence hasn't came out yet, or the evidence hasn't been seen yet? This judicial system is far from perfect, and there is no but, no, 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 because the judicial system is also based on a system of white supremacy. So therefore, 
to make it easier to hand out death sentences would reflect very negatively upon who? I think that's important. Let's continue. It says, like systemic state systems of exclusion and racially tainted preemptory strikes, non-unanimous non juries operate to exclude the voices of black jurors, thereby depriving jurors of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. The law, by design, operates to prevent up to a third of jurors having their voices heard. A law that denies jurors the equal right to have their voices heard is patently unconstitutional and undermines confidence and legitimacy in the judicial process. Tuesday's brief also said that the non jury non-unanimity has historically been and continues to function as a method to disenfranchise black jurors and to erase their voices in uh, dero uh, derogation of their constitutional rights. Such racial bias imperils the legitimacy of the entire judicial process. It says as of March 31st, only a fraction, 17% of resentencings decided under the unan uh, unanimity requirement have resulted in death sentences, according to the brief filed last week. While Jackson was sentenced after an 8 4 recommendation, a jury in January voted 9 to 3 to recommend death for inmate Bessem Okafor in an Orange County murder, but he will not be sentenced by a judge until June, which is this month. The court needs to recertify, uh, sorry, needs to rectify the unconstitutional arbitrariness created by this new subset of cases. The brief does not seek a ruling on the underlying constitutionality of the 8-4 law, but asks the court to level the playing field for those prisoners who are granted a new penalty phase after Hearst. The brief also maintained that the disparity in the application of the death sentencing standards violate constitutional protections against cruel and unusual punishment. Now, this is a point I wanna bring up. So the US Supreme Court has made clear that the rights include protection against the arbitrary infliction of the death penalty. The procedural roulette that Florida's death row prisoners have been forced to play since Hearst is the epitome of arbitrariness in the Eighth Amendment bars and capital punishment. So as the date a death sentence become final is dependent on several factors outside of the defendant's control. The brief filed last week argued the COVID-19 pandemic, natural disasters such as hurricane and attorney schedules can also slow the process. Jackson's case il illustrates uncertainty. Jackson was considered the mastermind behind the deaths of Reggie and Carol Sumner, a pair of 61 year olds who were buried alive after being kidnapped from their Jacksonville home. One of Jackson's co-defendants, Alan Wade, was resentenced to life in prison without parole under the unanimity law. Another co-defendant, Tiffany Cole, was resentenced to life under the 8-4 requirement. Now, here's the point. Had Mr. Jackson's resentencing proceeded just months earlier under the unanimity statute, he would have received a different sentence like Mr. Wade did. Imposing sentences of death based on chance is the antithesis of protections afforded by the Eighth Amendment and likewise Article 1, Section 17 of the Florida Constitution. Referring, uh, that's what uh, comments and argued, referring to the part of Florida Constitution that addresses cruel and unusual punishment. So, how would you feel if you were being sentenced and then Simply because the law changed a couple months ago, whereas if it was like, let's say it's a eight to four decision and you get the death penalty, if it had been a couple months earlier, you wouldn't have gotten the death penalty because it's not unanimous. Now, let's make it so that you are potentially innocent and you still got the death penalty under an 8 4 decision. You wouldn't have got the death penalty a few months earlier. You see how this is, 
You see how this is a dilemma here in Florida? So this is one of the reasons why people like myself are against the death penalty. Because ultimately, you risk the life of someone that didn't do anything wrong. And also, as far as the belief of restorative justice, you can't restore a person if they're dead. Now, people do heinous things, absolutely. But is that worth risking the life of somebody else who may be innocent over by having that system? You know? Mm. So let me share this too. Um, I want to share this from the Innocence Project. So this is Innocence and the Death Penalty. It says, in the last 30 years, exoneration cases have exposed the very real shortcomings of the American legal system. Let's get into it. it. Says the Innocent Project has represented innocent people who are wrongly convicted of murder and condemned to death in cases that were compromised by police and prosec prosecutorial misconduct, ineffective assistance of counsel, eyewitness misidentification, unreliable forensic evidence, racial bias, and more. In some instances, our clients have come within days of execution. These cases powerfully establish that notwithstanding legislative and constitutional guarantees of increased scrutiny for and oversight of such cases, the capital punishment system is deeply flawed and possesses an unconscionable threat to innocent people. For those reasons, the death penalty must be abolished. And this is why I'm against the death penalty. There is a risk too high to lose innocent life. If life is precious to you, you don't take that risk, especially in a system as flawed as, as, flawed as it is. Because there are so many people out there, particularly people that look like me, that are swept up into the system because of white supremacy that will be sentenced to death for something that a lot of us did not do. Remember when the Central Park Five were under trial and it was Donald Trump that recommended the death penalty for them? Remember when the Central Park Five were exonerated that they didn't commit that sexual assault in Central Park? What if they got the death penalty? What if they had been killed 40 years ago? We would have lost five, five innocent people because of a flawed system that is based on white supremacy that is disproportionately harmful to those of us that are black. So this is why the change in this law is dangerous. Let's continue. 
says since 1973, at least 190 people have been exonerated from death row in the U.S., according to the Death Penalty Information Center. A 2014 study estimated that at least 4% of those sentenced to death are innocent. These numbers don't demonstrate the full scope of the impact that the death penalty has on the problem of wrongful conviction as the threat of the death penalty causes innocent people to plead guilty and induces false testimony from witnesses. Because the vast majority of people exonerated from death row are black or Latin A, and more than half of death row exonerees are black. Studies consistently demonstrate that the race of the accused and or race of the victim play an arbitrary yet determinative role in the administration of the death penalty. This is significant in the context of wrongful conviction because official misconduct has been documented in three-fourths of the cases of Black exonerees and two-thirds of the cases of Latin A exonerees, while official misconduct is presented in less than 60% of cases of white exonerees. Although the Constitution promises equal justice for all, race continues to affect every stage of a capital case from arrest and investigation to eventual execution. Most homicides are intraracial. White people are more likely to kill white people. Black people are more likely to kill black people, etc. But the use of the death penalty for intraracial crimes has always been lopsided. Nearly 300 black people accused of murdering white people have been ex executed since 1976. That's almost 17 times more than the number of white people executed for murdering black people. The Innocence Project currently represents people on death row with strong claims of innocence and supports coalitions working to ban the use of death penalty. Virginia, Colorado, New Hampshire became the most recent states to outlaw capital punishment, but 27 states like Florida, the federal government and the U.S. military still allow the use of this arbitrary and brutal punishment. So this is why this is dangerous. And this is why I think it is absolutely horrible that this state has made administering the death penalty easier. We should not be allowing uh, this capital punishment to continue. As long as we have a deeply flawed system like this, we should not have capital punishment like this. It should not be allowed. If you want to keep life in prison, okay, fine. But we don't want to risk lives that may be innocent. We should not do that. So my hope is that we can change that here in Florida. But with the current system in place, I'm not holding my breath. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.